Good morning, everybody. I'm Franklin Escobedo. I'm the Community Services Director for the Larkspur Library. I thank you for joining us this morning for our garden talk. Um, today we have UC Master Gardener Bob Maselli, who's going to talk about fire smart landscaping. And um, we will be taking questions at the end of the, the lecture. So just make sure you use the Q&A to put your questions in and I'll relay your questions to Bob. So thank you again, Bob, for joining us this Saturday. We, we're glad to have you back and to get your expertise. And I'm going to hand this over to you now. So. Okay, fine. Thanks very much, frankly. Um, you know, there's been a lot of concern about how to deal with our gardens and landscapes in Marin um, due to an increasingly long and intense California fire season. Uh, people are concerned that the proposed codes and local ordinance changes will require severe changes uh, and reductions in the size and content of their gardens to reduce uh, fire hazard risk. Well, UCC um, Marin Master Gardeners believe that healthy home landscapes are an important component of a healthy and biodiverse ecology for Marin County. And also producing a less fire prone home environment. So we developed some fire smart um, uh, principles to help reduce landscape fire risk without serious reduction or elimination of garden and landscape plantings. And we think that following these principles can help you deal with fire risk while maintaining uh, a healthy and beautiful landscape. And we think that's very, very important. So um, we had a lot of questions about how to reduce fire risk without destroying established gardens. And that's important because the majority of gardens and landscapes in Marin are not new um, or starting just now. Um, they're established and have been established for many years in a lot of cases. So the subject of this presentation is just that, how to reduce fire hazard risk in home landscapes while maintaining their beauty and their ecological value. Um, it grew out of the questions we get and landscape fire risk reduction work that I started in my own home uh, in the winter of 2018 and 2019. And so my hope for this presentation is to give you some ideas about how you might go about doing that as well. Uh, and it really is a work in progress, actively continuing be in the past two years and into the future. Uh, but, but first, uh, a word from our sponsor. So we Master Gardeners, or MMGs for short, are people who have enjoyed gardening for most of our adult lives. We're trained, non-paid volunteers that are part of the UC Cooperative Extension. And our mission is to provide unbiased, peer-reviewed, research-based information to homeowners on home horticulture, pest management, and sustainable gardening practices. Um, and our website uh, is a great resource for lots of information on these topics and more, including fire smart landscaping. I'd like to start this presentation with a short video uh, by my colleague, Faye Mark, discussing the basic tenets of the MMG Fire Smart approach to planning and implementing a home landscape that reduces fire, ha fire hazard risk. Hi, I'm Faye Mark from the University of California Marin Master Gardeners. Today I'm going to show you how to create and maintain a beautiful fire smart landscape. Most traditional residential landscapes include foundation plantings and large trees and shrubs near the house. We're used to this look, but it turns out there are better ways of organizing your landscape that may help protect your home when a wildfire is burning nearby. We're often asked the question, what are the safest plants? Truth is, all plants burn. When it comes to fire smart landscaping, it's much more important to consider where a plant is situated and how it is maintained than to assume some plants are better than others. The area within five feet of your house is the most critical. 
During a wildfire, embers can travel long distances. They tend to collect near the base of a home's exterior walls and will ignite anything that burns. To avoid that, we recommend minimizing anything that can burn in this area, including wood mulch and plants. This also means moving items like firewood, lumber, patio furniture, and garbage cans. Clearing this area of combustibles is like creating a force field that defends your home against fire. This is a whole new way to think about landscaping since many of our homes have plantings right up against the walls and foundation. Just take it step by step. Start by removing plants in front of sliding glass doors or windows and remove any wood mulch. Next, focus on taller plants under eaves and vines climbing on your house. Low growing or ground hugging plants are less likely to cause a problem. Just be sure they're well hydrated and free of dead or dry material. Beyond five feet from the house, it's all about maintenance. The goal is to create defensible space that acts as a buffer between your house and your garden. It means looking at your garden with slightly different eyes. First, you want to interrupt the path of a fire by creating horizontal and vertical spacing between plants. That sounds complicated, but it's really not. You can create horizontal space by adding stepping stones, paths, patios, or walls. Any non-combustible surface between plantings helps stop the path of a fire. They can be as simple as gravel paths or as complicated as a low stone wall. The idea is to think of your planting beds as clumps or islands with non-combustible surfaces providing separation to keep a fire from spreading along the ground. Vertical spacing is about stopping fire ladders. Fire ladders are when fire from lower plants spreads to nearby taller plants. If you stroll through your garden, are there places where shrubs are close to low tree canopies? If, if so, try to create space between them. Limb up trees and keep shrubs pruned. It's an easy and important way of interrupting a fire's path. The density of plantings provides another clue about how a fire could travel through your garden. You want to have a little breathing space in your garden. Consider breaking up hedges and large swaths of uninterrupted plantings to stop fire in its tracks. Another good rule of thumb is to keep low growing plants closer to the house and taller plants away from the house. Second, you want to reduce your garden's fuel load. This is a fancy way of saying, keep your garden cleaned up. Anything that burns is fuel for a fire. Diseased, dried, or overgrown trees and shrubs have more fuel than well-pruned trees and shrubs. So do weeds, leaves, and pine needles in roof gutters and debris that's gathered under decks. Keep things cleaned up to starve fire of fuel. As we like to say, don't be fuelish. Don't worry, you don't need to pick up every last leaf on the ground. Just be on the lookout for excess fuel, being extra vigilant the closer you are to your home or other built structures. Do you see plant material that would be useful for starting a campfire? If so, that's probably a good clue that it needs to be removed. Step into your garden and look up. Do you see tree branches near the roof line? Try to keep branches 10 feet from your roof or chimney and definitely not touching the walls of your house. That way you'll avoid a buildup of needles and leaves on your roof and your rain gutters. Are there any diseased, dead, or dried shrubs or trees that need to be pruned or removed? Now look down. Are paths clear of debris? Do plants look healthy and hydrated? Plants that are properly hydrated are more resistant to fire and to pests and diseases. Even some drought resistant plants may need a little supplemental water during extended dry periods. What about mulch? A layer of mulch improves soil quality, regulates soil temperature, reduces weeds, and helps retain water. Use non-combustible mulches like stone or gravel within five feet of any structure, including decks and sheds. Further out, choose larger composted wood chips and avoid applying mulch greater than two inches deep. Now let's talk about choosing plants, a favorite topic for master gardeners. We recommend plants that don't need much water, are easy to maintain, and that contribute to the ecological health of the surrounding area. We also suggest avoiding plants that are messy or invasive, like ivy and pampas grass, meaning they grow or spread so fast it's hard to keep them under control. Remember, you're trying to reduce your fuel load. 
Start by assessing your garden's growing conditions, such as sun exposure and climate, and then select plants that thrive in that environment. In other words, choose the right plant for the right place. Don't worry, we have tools to help you with that. Just visit the UC Marin Master Gardener website to learn more. We even have plant lists that you can print and take to the nursery. We also have demonstration gardens where you can check out dozens of plants firsthand that are beautiful, colorful, and suitable for our Marin microclimates. Visit us at the Falkirk Cultural Center in San Rafael and at Harvey's Garden at Blackie's Pasture in Tiburon. That's it. Thanks for joining me and congratulations on taking the first step towards creating a gorgeous, thriving, fire smart landscape. Happy gardening. So our, our guiding premise in all this is that our gardens and landscapes are really important to the environmental health of the land that surround us. And therefore they are um, important to producing an ecologically healthy environment in Marin County and they're worth preserving uh, because they preserve and enhance wildlife um, um, biodiversity by sustaining important beneficial plant and wildlife habitats. Um, they also provide natural services that we can't do without. Services like sequestering carbon, producing oxygen, creating soil and increasing its health capturing water runoff and more. And, and not, not, not to make any di difference about it, but uh, they also provide an environment for people to relax, to get exercise and enjoy beauty. Um, I gotta tell you, in this COVID, if it wasn't for my um, garden and the ability to get out there and do some work, uh, it would have been a lot harder to get through the past year. So um, in desperation, when, when we moved to Marin, we had mostly a weedy, barren landscape of about six tenths of an acre on a steep, hot, south-facing hill of mostly hard clay, but with 10 beautiful mature valley oaks and 21 relatively young um, uh, olive trees. Um, and so in desperation, we were really looking for ways to improve this. And we did, in fact, develop a plan to change from that barren wasteland to this. And this. And this. And this. But it, it all begins with the plants, with plants like these. Uh, manzanita and uh, currant, wild currant, and uh, fermentia, uh, and um, salvia cliblendii. Um, and a lot of ceanothus. Um, there's four different species uh, or cultivars of it. And my wife says, I've never met a Ceanothus I didn't like. And she's right. We grow, we grow more than 15 different varieties. And here we have these perennials, beautiful perennials, like um, the uh, California fuchsia in the upper left, uh, like uh, red flowered buckwheat and salvia and in the lower uh, left, um, coyote mint, and in the lower right, chaparral clematis. And you may have noticed that all of these are native Californians because my garden is native Californian. Um, and here we have wildflowers um, that are mainly in here in the spring and really beautify it. And we don't do anything to grow these, they just grow by themselves. So given that it all begins with the plants, what we'd like to do is convince you to build and sustain healthy gardens while reducing fire hazard risk. And a healthy residential landscape is the result 
of providing best horticultural and gardening practices for your yard. Most importantly, because healthy plants are more fire resistant than plants struggling to survive. They will be more resilient to embers and heat from flames from the wildfire. And there's a lot of wildfire, a lot of material on our website on best practices, especially for plant health. Uh, choosing the plants that will thrive in the basic elements, in elements of your landscape site. Uh, that would include your microclimate, sun exposure, topography, and soil. Uh, and planning the plants, plants placement and spacing to improve their health and reduce fire danger. And using good care and maintenance practices, including mulching, pruning, cleanup, and an efficient water thrifty, well-maintained irrigation system for appropriate hydration. Those are things that will keep your landscape healthy and more fire safe. Oh, and uh, we'd like you to consider using California natives. Uh, and there are some really good reasons why you might wanna do that. Uh, first of all, they encourage biodiversity because they're visited and used more heavily by wildlife. Uh, and like this butterfly, they're required by butterflies as host plants for their uh, eggs and caterpillars to turn into butterflies. They also lighten the ecological load on the environment. Native plants use less water, chemicals, and are more in tune with this, the, our environments, uh, no matter where you are. Uh, in uh, Marin County. So uh, I did say consider native plants, didn't I? And so why do you think I said that? Because native plants have grown up with everything else in Marin County. They co-evolved together with our Mediterranean climate, our geography and topography, our soil, even uh, in our heavy clay soil, um, and all the animals, birds, and insects that share our county with us. And as native plants check most of the boxes on the list in the foregoing slides, they might be among some of your best choices. Uh, this uh, Western tiger swallowtail nectaring on a native verbena uh, in the picture knew that, and so should you. So fire smart landscape principles have been developed by our master gardener project team. And those principles are guiding the work that I'm doing on fire smarting my landscape. So a brief description of what they are and what led to them uh, is in order. California wildfires are becoming more frequent, more intense, and more destructive. And this represents a serious public safety and personal wildfire risk in Marin County, uh, serious enough that it requires direct action and other by fire and other public safety agencies and individual families to try to reduce that risk and deal with that. Now, what causes this? Why is it a pro problem of critical concern? Well, the, the thing that we do know is that 80% of Marin's land areas are designated as having moderate to very high fire hazard severity ratings. And most of those uh, areas with very high fire hazard severity ratings are in the wildland urban interface. And that represents 65% uh, of the living units in Marin, including mine. Uh, so what to do? Well, first, prepare for a fire. Contact your local fire agency and www.firesafemarin.org for information about evacuations and the preparations needed to do so. Go bags, things to take, routes to follow, communications, safe places and more. If you haven't done this already, start now. It's really important. Second, let's consider um, fire 
and what we can do to mitigate this. Um, if fire requires oxygen, heat, and fuel, which of these do you think that you can control? It's fuel. And that fuel represents both your home and your landscape. And the best strategy for minimizing costly damage from wildfires is to manage on a long-term basis the structural conditions that fuel a fire. So harden your home and other structures on the property. Create defensible space around the structures and create a fire smart landscape to further reduce fire risk in that defensible space. Here's why. Now let me quote Steve Swain, the UCC Environmental Horticulture Advisor for Marin and Sonoma counties. When creating a fire smart landscape, he says, we advise homeowners to design defensible space and maintain their landscape according to UC Master Gardener duck guidelines. For a new or renovated landscape, consider native or other pollinator friendly plants that require little water um, and are easy to maintain. There are no published fire wise or fire resistant plant lists that are science based or peer reviewed. Design and maintenance are more important than plant selection. So the real answer is that you should choose a landscape design and plants, native or non-native, whose requirements, cultural, mature size, maintenance and water requirements are in sync with your site. Uh, and this is the mantra that I'm following as best I can in the work that I'm going to describe. Let me explain. First, plan and create defensible space around structures. Uh, and that includes potentially flammable objects near them in space like trash bins, garden debris, mulch, and yes, including your plants and your neighbor's plants too. Second, deal with plants as potential full fuel in the landscape. Think about placement, spacing, and separation of plants to reduce fire spread. Grouping plants and building fire grapes breaks between groups, limbing up trees and pruning shrubs to reduce fire ladders, and continuing pruning, maintenance, and irrigation needed to keep a healthy garden healthy and fire safe. So turn it back and turn your place back into a wasteland to fire smart your home? Uh, we don't think so. In fact, it could exacerbate the situation through exotic and invasive weed growth, stressed trees, and other situations brought on by the unhealthy landscape created by such extreme treatment. Uh, so as you saw in the video, defensible space is part of a larger landscape management strategy that's designed to protect your home and property. And it consists of three zones whose distances from your home are related to the potential risk of fire damage to your home and property. Um, and they are now here, zone zero, or the immediate or ember resistant zone. So called because it represents the most immediate fire risk to your home and landscape from wildfire embers that can accumulate around your house within five feet of the house and are responsible for most wildfire damage. To begin then, therefore, start now working on zone zero to get in shape because this area is most responsible for most structures being damaged or destroyed by wildfire. Um, and as you heard in the video, embers are responsible for the most damage during wildfires. So that's where we started. There are things we did first and that you too can do them and you should really start right now. Keeping the five feet closest to your home clear of flammable materials greatly improves the chance of you and it surviving a fire. So we started there. 
no flammable mulch fencing furniture, no dead branches, no roof litter, no tall plants under the eaves, nothing flammable attached to the house, no branches within 10 feet of the roof or from the chimney. Plants and materials to consider are stone, gravel, pavers, or decomposed, decomposed granite. Um, within five feet of the home, use these non-combustible ignition resistant uh, materials. Also use ignition resistant plant materials, such as well irrigated, well maintained lawn and low growing plants. Um, succulents, low growing plants that are woody, non-woody and well irrigated. Um, and don't forget that these could all be native plants. We'll talk a little bit about that pretty quickly. So here's my home in Nevada. It's got wood siding, but with a class A roof, metal gutters and twin pane windows. Uh, there were two trees close to the walls of the house or over the roof of the house. Here's one of them, it's an ornamental pear. You can't see the second, but it was a young uh, valley oak that was planted way too close to the house. Um, a neighbor's dying hedge was over here. Um, and foundation plants were tall and dense, and some of them, uh, such as um, uh, lavender and uh, other plants, were uh, close to the house in fact, even touching the walls of the house. And of course, we had plastic bins, storage shelves, firewood, um, and uh, workbenches near to or against the exterior walls. Well, that easy stuff went quickly. The firewood was burned and not replaced. Trash bins, storage shelves, and so on were moved to at least 10 feet away from the house. And we installed six reels of 100-foot hose and five high capacity pulsating tri tripod speakers uh, at all of the lower uh, hose bibs to uh, both irrigate uh, once or twice a month uh, in the summer and fire season, and also to give firefighters something to defend our home with if it came to that. We started with the foundation plants that were touching the house and in front of the windows or under the eaves or overhangs like these. Um, you can see them here and here and here. Uh, the ornamental pear and valley oak close to or overhanging the house were removed, as were foundation plants touching the house. And those were replaced with pebbles like you see in this in this picture. Um, actually, they were luckily a pretty good color match to the house color. Um, and we're probably not ever going to plant anything in areas like this that are so narrow um, that there's no way to avoid plants touching uh, the structure. Uh, roses and fine leaf plants against the house were removed and again replaced by pebbles in this for and after um, uh, picture. Um, and we also installed 14 fire resistant foundation um, vents to start hardening our house. And we're now in the process of replacing our existing wood siding with hardy board fire resistant and we hope acorn resistant, acorn woodpecker resistant siding. Um, and installing fire resistant soffit and gable vents. As I mentioned before, these foundation plants were densely planted with rosemary and lavender that had grown to about two feet tall. We removed those but uh, kept this large rush plant uh, against the house next to the glass doors on the left. And we replaced the others with coral bells, herbs, sage, and other plants like these strawberry plants. 
Um, but we didn't provide any non-flammable separation between these plants and the walls of the house. Uh, we corrected that by installing good looking three foot borders of pebbles between the walls and the plants in both cases, in both foundation points. And again, planted with coral bells, things like low growing salvia, catmint and herbs. Uh, it looks beautiful in spring and summer and the bees, hummingbirds, butterflies and hoverflies think so too. But when it's fire smart pruned in the fall fire season, it becomes safe and easy to maintain. Uh, and you'll notice that the rush plant that was growing against the house uh, has been removed. Now to address the area uh, more than five feet from the home. And here there are more um, uh, uh, options open to you in terms of the landscape. So at 30 feet, flames are less likely to ignite a home. So closer to the house, we use low, well irrigating plants. But once we get out, 10 feet or more from the house, larger shrubs and trees, perhaps even trees growing up to about 20 to 30 feet um, uh, are uh, able to be installed uh, if, you, if you don't already have them. Um, and 30 foot from the house, you can begin to introduce wood mulch and other perhaps somewhat more flammable uh, material. Um, hopefully using hardscapes or clear clearings between plantings as fuel breaks. Allowing vertical and horizontal space between shrubs and especially on slopes. And with all plants accessible for cleanup, maintenance and irrigation. This is really important. Maintenance is key here. Uh, and because your distances may go up to or beyond your property, you may have to work with your neighbors uh, to achieve appropriate defensible space. Um, and in these areas, your evacuation route is as important as your house. Uh, the landscaping along the evacuation route needs to be managed so you can safely evacuate and make sure that your de defensible space will also let firefighters safely get to your property and protect it. So the first thing to start with is to mow tall grass and weeds in the open space on your property. And as you can see in this picture here, you're looking north, that we've done that. We usually do this on the north and west side of our property in April and again in May to the end of June or early July. Uh, we do it every year without fail. Now the fence in the back is between our property and Monroe County's Rush Creek Open Space Preserve. They mow an additional 15 to 20 yards on their side of the boundary. But on our west side, which is to your left in this picture, um, the boundary is only 30 to 40 feet from our house. Here, they mow more than 30 to 40 yards, usually by uh, the end of June or early July, giving us more than uh, 100 feet of defensible space. They also don't mow there until the nesting barn owls in a house on one of our oaks um, play, fletch, as well as nesting birds in the open space. We work with this neighbor. They're a good one. Here's another view of the property looking toward a neighbor on the right. And you're looking at about 90 feet from the house here. So, so what's your reaction? Good? Bad? Well, uh, the real truth is that's an after picture. Here's a before picture a large acacia hedge, a planting of dense catonia aster and low growing coastal live oaks on a steep hill 
provided a serious fire ladder that needed work. So the acacia and petoniaster were removed from under the live oaks and the oaks were limbed up to about 10 to 12 feet above grade to deal with the fire ladder. But it also removed an important privacy screen and bird habitat. And those were reasons that we bought this home. So, so that was kind of a bummer, but it needed to be done. Whoa, and it added bonus, surprise, surprise. In the spring of 2019, a few small Arroyo Lupin and California poppy plants volunteered in the now cleared space. Those wildflower seeds must have been waiting for years to be set free from under the acacia and catoniaster. We let those plants go to seed uh, and that fall we added some seed of our own. Um, and look what we got last spring. 40 feet of native Arroyo Lupin, California poppies, and some un un unexpected Clarkia. It's pretty. They started blooming in early to mid-February, continued until late Friday, late February, uh, late May and early. Uh, and then since they're annuals, they were cut down for seed for the following year. Truly fire smart. Even after removing the acacia and catoniaster, my neighbor's large myoporum hedge was still overgrown into my yard, close to my house, and invested, infested with myoforum thrips. So there was significant dead or dying wood, as you can see in this picture looking from the front and from my backyard, really overgrown. I had it trimmed on the property line from my side of the fence. And here's what it looks like now from the front, clear to more than 10 feet from the side of the house. And the same in the back. This was a serious fire risk that has been at least partially reduced. Somewhat more fire safe, but still not great uh, because of the dying wood. Now, I'm not sure what plans my neighbor has for the hedge on his side, but it's got to be as much a danger to his house as it is to mine. We also have 10 beautiful valley oaks whose low hanging branches some, as you can see in this picture, almost touching the ground, could become a fire ladder in a wildfire. We had a server, cer certified arborist uh, limb these up to about 10 to 15 feet above grade. They're now, looks pretty nice. And the trees are lit by lamps underneath and they're now strikingly more dramatic at night. The height has also provided better conditions for and ability to maintain the plants that grow underneath or around of the trees. Um, and we really love our oak trees. On the oak trees further out in zone three, um, we had prostrate leptosporum planted to provide erosion control on a steep portion of the garden. Um, bad choice, wrong plant, wrong place. These had become overgrown and twiggy. They were in an area that was difficult to maintain, especially to prune out dead wood. And their needle-like foli foliage added up to a serious potential fire hazard. So they're gone. We put wattles on the hill to hold the hill and we've planted now with low growing and low maintenance uh, easy to maintain plants. We planted Ceanothus, Anchor Bay, and low-growing Ribes. Um, in about two years, it's gonna look beautiful. And here we have on the left, a uh, Budlia, and on the right, uh, Salvia, Branda, E-G-I, um, uh, both valuable pollinator plants, but both had become seriously overgrown and twiggy and they could have become a fire ladder hazard. Um, they've now been reduced in height and printed, pruned out um, to clean up inside the plants. Um, so we have better vertical and horizontal separation and the dead wood has been removed. But if they can't be kept clean and controlled, they'll re 
be replaced with easier to maintain pollinator plants. And there are plenty that would grow in the space that they're in. And continuing work throughout the other areas on our hill has opened up less dense plantings of established native plants to produce better horizontal separation and reduced fire spread. And all the plants that you see in this particular area are more than 40 feet uh, from the house. But about 30 to 35 feet from the back of the house is a large planting and it's that large green planting that you see in this picture um, of um, dwarf uh, coyote bush. Um, and it was planted to hold a particularly steep area of our hill. Uh, in fact, some fire agencies have in the past at least also consider such plantings of coyote bush, dwarf coyote bush as a fire break if it's kept sheared and hydrated. Well, it does get watered once or twice per month in summer and fire season with overhead sp sprinklers, but we've never sheared it. And my planting uh, may have overachieved. Uh, it's quite overgrown or was quite overgrown because it was never sheared or controlled. So we've now had it lightly sheared and trimmed. Um, we've removed some ground cover plants that were immediately behind it and touching it. Um, and um, we've cleared out some of the plantings around this, but it would be difficult to replace this ground cover for the following reasons. First, it really does provide important erosion control. Second, it shelters nesting, ground nesting and skulking birds. Uh, underneath it. In fact, we've had three um, families of California quail uh, nest underneath that with their young. And finally, when it's in bloom in September through October, it has in the past attracted hordes of butterflies and other pollinators that are seriously endangered or uh, difficult in our area to find. The planted area around our water feature uh, that's uh, right below the back of its ground cover had also overachieved. It too had become seriously overgrown. And the overgrown plants around the water feature uh, and stream bed was sharply pruned back or removed. Some will be replaced with more restrained pollinator plants, but not all. We really want to see the artistic stonework of the water feature as the water tumbles down through the dry stream bed. So uh, we've got work to be done. Um, and most of the preceding descriptions were well out into zone ones or two. And the examples of the work that we still have to do um, are also. So this bears repeating. This is the way we're trying to do it. Less dense, vertical horizontal separ separation, trees limbed up, screw, shrubs pruned, pruned down, and fire breaks put in. And then designing what's left for garden maintenance, plant care, and appropriate irrigation. So here's a beautiful stand of six-year-old Lewis Edmonds Manzanita and Gravilla. It was planted to provide beauty, privacy, hill holding, and bird attraction. But it really, now that it's grown up, needs de-densification, as does an equally beautiful stand of sunset manzanita across the path from the former. Both of these are up on a steep part of the hill and partially under limbed up oaks, but they're more than 60 feet from the house. So we're seeking some aesthetic, aesthetic help to see how we should pr proceed in demassing uh, these beautiful um, plants. So to recap, yes, you do want an attractive green belt around your home. And so the first thing to do is avoid overcorrection. It's ugly, 
unhealthy, non-biodiverse or unsustainable, and probably won't achieve your defendable space objectives. A barren landscape, as I said before, creates unintended consequences uh, and can become a maintenance nightmare at the very least. It's also unnecessary. You can have a healthy, beautiful, biodiverse and sustainable landscape as the one on the right without denuding your private landscape and garden. What you really need to do is clean up, densify and demass the landscape in the top picture on the left and as shown in the bottom right by eliminating plants against the house, creating islands of plants and separation between them farther out in the garden and correct, correcting fire ladders by limbing up and pruning. So the bottom right is what you want the house to look like, but still have a beautiful and useful garden. Uh, and don't forget maintenance and irrigation is a critical year round task. Plan, plan so that you can and will do it. Um, it needs to be ongoing. Cleaning up, watering, mulching, um, and with major things every few years or as needed, pruning, limbing up, and so on needs to be done. We have our landscape service work on this in maintenance calls every two weeks because remember, more important than plant species choice is planning and maintenance, particularly maintenance. So thanks for li listening. I hope that this has helped you understand that you can make your garden or landscape fire smart without damaging its environmental, ecological, and aesthetic value. Thanks for coming. Questions? So um, right before we get questions, let me run a poll real quick. I'm always forgetting to take account of master gardeners attending. So if you guys could, um, if you're a master gardener, just click yes, or and if you're not, just click no. And if you have questions, please use the Q&A box and I'll relay those, relay those questions to Bob. So. Okay, so the first question is, what is the FireWise community and how do I know if I live in one? My insurance agent asked me this. Um, one of the ways that you can find that out is to go to the um, um, FireSafe Marin uh, website. Um, and uh, I believe that they have maps of some of the, well, of, of all of the fire safe communities that they know about up there. Um, the, uh, but, but I'm surprised that if you are in a fire safe community, that you have not been contacted by the committee that usually supports that in your neighborhood. Um, so you might want to ask some of your neighbors um, uh, or uh, the local fire agency uh, where you live uh, about, uh, are you in such a community? Okay, and somebody's asking, uh, many homes have wood decks. Um, what's a possible solution to make these fire resistant? That's, that's a, well, the, the first thing to do is make sure there's nothing underneath them. Um, because uh, that's, that, that's what can happen uh, in an ember storm uh, is the stuff, the embers fall down into that area. And if it's got a lot of combustible materials, uh, it will in fact start a fire. Um, the second thing you can do, uh, which, which I'm not exactly sure how you go about doing that, but one of the things that we have uh, done some research on is that if there are uh, wider spaces uh, between the boards, particularly if those boards are uh, combustible, um, then the embers will fall through. But if there's nothing underneath there for them to burn, they'll smolder out. Um, uh, 
as far as I know personally, there are no um, materials normally used uh, in um, uh, decks, uh, either wood or uh, the, the various um, uh, comports of plastic and wood and so on that are totally uh, fire resistant. Uh, but, the, but the thing is to provide uh, nothing around the, the, the uh, deck that can set it on fire. Um, and, the, you know, I mean, if, if, if firefighters can get into your property, that, that's probably the first things that they will wet down are decks. Okay, so the next question is, what exactly makes the water supply useful to firefighters? I'm, I'm sorry, say again, uh, so, Franklin? What exactly makes a water supply useful to firefighters? Okay, uh, the first thing that, that makes it is um, to have things that they can use to move that water onto a fire uh, or onto smoldering areas in the garden. Um, and what our local uh, Novato Fire District um, uh, inspector advised me was to put a reel of hose on every one of the bibs on the, on the level floor around the house. Uh, and what she said was that the firefighters will in fact use those um, to uh, try to knock down fires. Um, uh, the second thing that's important is, uh, you know, when you get a red flag warning um, uh, or if there is an active fire somewhere in the area, don't start spraying your garden and so on because what you might possibly do if everybody did it is lower the water pressure in, in your entire area um, and, and then inhibit um, or, or deter uh, firefighters from using that. Um, if you can, um, you know, uh, provide, if you, for example, have a, 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 a um, swimming pool and you can, you, if you can uh, have a uh, pump that firefighters can use, a gasoline powered pump um, to draw water from that, that's a good thing. And, and have uh, a hose reel near that pump so they can use that. Those are the kinds of things that firefighters will look for uh, and, and help decide that they're gonna take your house instead of some other house to do it. Um, the, 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 the problem about this is, is that if everybody tries to use um, the water the water pressure can drop so low that um, even the hydrants uh, won't be able to give firefighters enough pressure um, to work in the area. So let them decide where they can go and what kinds of water uh, on your property and on your neighbor's property that they can use to fight the fire. And they will try to do that. If you've got questions specifically in your area, Go to your fire agency, as I did um, here in Novato, and they will give you advice um, specific to your area on what you should and should not do. Okay, so someone's asking if the slides for the presentation will be available afterwards. Um, well, we can, we, uh, as we've done before with you, Franklin, we can... Um, you know, uh, send you uh, a, um, uh, a PDF of the presentation, uh, which you can put on your, um, uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know, your site. Um, we have in, on, on our um, website in uh, the Master Gardeners, a lot of material that this presentation um, is, is called from. And so you can go there also and find uh, this, this kind of information. 
there is a specific site on our Master Gardener website for fire smart uh, landscaping. Um, and a lot of the material that's in this presentation will be there as well. So that's two sources um, uh, that, that you, can, you, you can use. I don't know, did you, did you record this, Franklin? Yeah, no, we're recording as well. So we'll, in the follow-up email, I'll send the links to all the sites that Bob talked about, as well as a link to the recording. And then if you didn't get the email yesterday or this morning, we did have this fire smart um, landscaping handout that, that we have. So, and I just put that again in the chat. So if you didn't see it, you can click on it and that will take you to um, the, the brochure that we have. So, Okay, so the next kind of question is what kind of shade plants might work? Um, we have a dry shade in a lot of our yards. Okay, so do we, <laughs> you're looking at it. <laughs> Those are our valley oaks and that's dry shade. Um, and what's growing beautifully under it is hummingbird sage, Salvia spathaceae. Um, and it's a ground cover. Um, it um, uh, it, it uh, is uh, bright green. It's, um, you know, the, the, the leaves grow about a foot and a half or so tall. And it has red flowers of spikes that come up. Uh, that, the, that are mobbed by the hummingbirds, so it's aptly named, uh, and it is the quintessential recommendation for planting under oaks. Um, and there are other things uh, that you can grow under oaks, um, uh, particularly on the edge of uh, where the egg, uh, oaks are, uh, ribes, the uh, wild currant uh, is, a, is a good choice if, if you can keep them pruned low enough or limb up your oaks so that that's safe. Um, and there are other things that you can grow. Again, there's a list of plants for shade on our website. Um, and uh, I believe if you go to the um, native plants uh, portion, of the website, you'll find it there. Um, so those are some things that you can do. Uh, and it depends on how dense the shade is as to what will do well. The, the hummingbird sage does well even in dense shade. Okay, so the next question is, what would you recommend as a replacement for a juniper and a cypress? We're in a condo by the water in a flat area with well-maintained landscape. How close are those trees and how large are they? Did, 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 well, I can't tell you that, but that's one thing to think about. Um, if, if The second thing to think about is, will your condo HOA uh, let you do anything with it or will you have to work through them? Uh, there are, however, a number of small trees uh, that will work in that area. Western redbud comes to mind, uh, but there are uh, others and there are shrubs that will work in that kind of an area. Um, and uh, again, um, to, to, to find lists of some of these, our website is a really good source, as is the so website of the uh, California Native Plant Society uh, Marin uh, chapter website. Um, and there are other um, uh, lists that you can look at for plants that might well replace uh, the junipers and cypress plants. Um, and uh, frankly, if they're close to the structure, I would in fact recommend uh, that if they can't be pruned down and cleaned out, um, that they probably should be replaced. But I, I would do two things. I would talk to, again, your local fire agency about that. Um, and I would also talk to the management of the uh, HOA for the condo uh, community that you're in. Okay, if someone's asking, would you suggest water features as a fire smart landscape element? 
You know, that's interesting. Uh, ours is, um, has got a small pond. Uh, I mean, really small. It's only about, you know, 200 gallons. Um, and uh, I'm not sure how far uh, that will go, but anything would help. Um, any, and, and one of the things that I do know is that if, if you can do something like dry stream beds around the water feature or something like that, those uh, become pretty good fire breaks um, and can be, while even, you know, well, not you, namely utilizing the water, just the existence of those can help break up um, a firescape landscape. Um, I, I, you know, we keep our um, uh, water feature uh, full, um, and uh, I, I, uh, I have water capture uh, from the roof, so we've got about uh, five to six hundred gallons of water to keep it reasonably full. And I hope that's just one more thing that will attract firefighters to this area to help save the house. Okay, and then we have another question. Are there types of wood mulches that are more fire resistant than others? E.g. would pine mulch be a better choice than eucalyptus mulch or does it really matter? Well, it does matter. Um, and the, the, the one that um, uh, some testing that's been done uh, by uh, the uh, University of Nevada Cooperative Extension has shown that um, uh, wood mulch that is composted, and it's, it's called by a number of different names. It's called composted wood mulch. It's called uh, arborist wood mulch. Um, and things like that. Um, and if you go to um, uh, some of our local um, bulk uh, amendment uh, sellers, uh, both on, in, in West Marin and here um, uh, in uh, East Marin, um, you can get that. Um, we, we would recommend that, um, but we would recommend it um, you know, 25 to 30 feet away from the house. We really don't like uh, having wood mulch too close to the house. Um, it can be used there. Uh, that's probably the best thing to use if you need that. The other thing you can use for a mulch, um, particularly closer to the house, is compost itself. Uh, two inches of compost on a bed like you're looking at in this picture, um, and in fact, which we just had done this fall, uh, makes a pretty damn good mulch. It's, it, it'll hold moisture, and it also, uh, you know, helps uh, 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 revitalize the soil. Um, so I, th I think that's a winner, and that is what we use close to the house. Um, uh, we use just straight compost, um, and which we get from a, a number of different bulk source suppliers uh, in the area. Uh, and it seems to do pretty well as a mulch that keeps down um, weeds um, and that uh, holds moisture as well as revitalizing the soil. Okay, it looks like that's, if nobody has any other questions, it's your last chance to put them in the Q&A box. <laughs> and about the cypress and pine, it does look like they are, they are close to homes and um, the person is on the board of the HOA. So they're, they're working to be firewise, Bob. So. <laughs> okay, well, if that's the case, then I would definitely recommend uh, that that person contact their local fire agency. They will send um, what's called wildfire mitigation uh, examiners out and they can make specific recommendations uh, because they have not only, uh, you know, the view of, of what's a good plant and a not, a not so good plant to be close to homes, but they also have the knowledge of what uh, firefighters look for and can do. So that looks like there's no more questions. Thank you again, Bob, for joining us.
Well, uh, thank everybody for coming. <laughs> and, um, and just everybody keep an eye on your emails. I'll be sending out a follow-up email with the Master Gardener survey, as well as links to everything Bob talked about and a link to his last talk that he did on California natives. Because if you're looking to make your, uh, your landscape fire smart, he's right. You got to use California natives. And Bob's given us a couple good lectures on that. And I'll send you a link to those recordings as well. So you guys all have a great afternoon. Thank you again, Bob, for joining us. And we'll see you guys next time. Great. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.